It almost died about 10 years ago. And I was fortunate enough to come out on the other side of that. And so when I came out on the other side of that, not that I didn't approach my life in a certain way before, but it just made me appreciate life that much more. And so every day I'm chasing something different. Every day the way I operate is totally different. And it's not about the product for me as much as it is about the process. And what I mean about the process, the process saved my life. Meaning the way I go about my life and the way I approach certain things, it saved my life. It wasn't because I was this talented kid. It wasn't because I was this privileged kid. It was because of the way that I approached the process and the things that I understood about what the process can produce in my life. And I'm going to give you an example. It's not so much about when I played the game of football, it wasn't about the stats for me. It was more about me taking pride in coming out down after down, quarter after quarter, and dominating my opponent and basically imposing my will on him to the point where he looked at his coach and said, man, I don't want to go out and face him again. Because I know not only is he going to beat me, he's going to have fun with it, and he's going to bring it every single play, every single quarter. That's a different type of pride. But to give you the backstory of how I became the individual that I am, I carry two things with me everywhere that I go. And I'm talking about everywhere that I go. I carry a football with me and I carry a bucket. And the football, the backstory to the, the football is this. I got a good friend, a guy by the name of Eric Berry. He's in the NFL now. He went first round, fifth pick to the Kansas City Chiefs, one of the highest paid safeties in the NFL. Really talented kid. And so last year I went up to watch him play and I get up to about two games a year and I went up to watch him play and they played against the Seattle Seahawks. He went out, he played lights out. After the game, he came over to me and he had a football. And so he tossed me the football and I caught the football and as I was tossing it back to him, I said, man, what's that? He said, Ink, that's the game ball. And I said, man, you keep that. He said, no, nah, Ink, I'll get plenty more of those. He said, I want you to give that to your son. So I said, I appreciate it. And so I looked at the ball and on it had the score 2024 Kansas City Chiefs. Had be legendary on it. And it had the Bible verse Jeremiah 29 11. The next week they went out to play against the Oakland Raiders. It got late in the game. My guy, he went up, he filled the gap and he hit a running back. And at the point of contact, when he hit the guy, I knew something wasn't right. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something wasn't right. And so he came, he was jogging off the field, he got over to the sideline, they started touching, feeling around the shoulder area. The next morning he called me, he said, Big Bro, did you see the game? I said, yeah, I saw the game, but what I did notice, you didn't finish the game, what happened? He said, yeah, because when I hit that running back, it felt as if I knocked something loose in my shoulder and I got over to the sideline, they started touching and feeling, and they couldn't find anything, and so they're taking me to the hospital in Kansas City. I said, call me after you come from the hospital. He called me after he came from the hospital. I said, what did they say? He said, man, Ink, they told me they found a mass in my chest the size of a softball. I said, what did you say? He said, man, I asked him, can I still play Sunday? Beast, right? And he said, the doctors responded by saying, no, son, you don't get it. Like, this can be cancer. This can be serious. We got to send you down to Emory University to get some further testing done to see if this is cancer. They sent them down to Emory University getting testing done. He got diagnosed with cancer, lymphoma. Could no longer play in the NFL, had to start going through chemo. Going through chemo, started losing his hair, started losing his muscle mass. But the thing that intrigued me about him and the reason that I told people when they would say, Ink, are you worried about EB? I said, I'm not worried about him at all because I know EB the person and not EB the athlete. And so by knowing EB the person, I knew the character that he possessed. This is the same guy I watched leave chemotherapy and he would leave chemo and go jump out on the track and run 400 meters after he left chemo. And he would be crying as he was running around the track, but the tears wasn't because he was in so much pain. The tears wasn't because he wanted to give up. The tears were because he couldn't kick it in gear like he used to. But this is the same guy when they diagnosed him cancer free and he went back to the NFL, he returned back to the NFL a pound heavier. What is that? And it had nothing to do with the product, but more about the process because the thing I believe in whatever you do, who you are as a person is way more important than who you are as an athlete. But I tell you that story to tell you this, never take life for granted because sometimes life doesn't send a warning shot. And if you're not who you're supposed to be, adversity is not gonna say, man, I'm gonna let you gather yourself and I'm gonna come back. Our position is not gonna say, man, I'm gonna let you get your stuff together and I'm gonna be back. Like, I didn't know my life was gonna change on September the 9th. I was playing football, I was doing the thing that I love. I was eight games away from the NFL, projected top 30 draft pick, and I went out and made a tackle and found myself in the emergency room that night fighting for my life. But my mother had nothing to worry about. They asked my mother, are you worried about your son? She said, I'm not worried about him at all because I know he's a survivor. What is that? 
And that leads me into why I keep this bucket with me. You know, a lot of people know I live by this thing called empty the bucket, right? And people like empty the bucket, ain't, ain't got this cute slogan, empty the bucket, but they don't know what the foundation or what it really is. They don't know the accountability behind it. They don't know the responsibility behind it. Every day in my house, I got three buckets. I got a bucket when I wake up and I look in my bedroom, it's a bucket. I got a bucket in my office. I got a bucket in my weight room at my house. And what that bucket stands for, for me, that bucket means I have to give everything I got to everything I'm involved in, and it has nothing to do with the product, but more about my personal standard of excellence never changes. And it doesn't depend on the circumstances, it doesn't depend on a situation, and it never depends on a person. I have a personal standard of excellence for my life. I just believe I deserve, my, I, I, I deserve to give my wife the best version of me. I just believe I deserve to give my kids the best version of me. I just believe the people that I'm of service to on this earth, I deserve to give them the best version of me. And so I take a personal level of pride in everything that I do because I almost lost my life behind the game of football and God placed me on this path. And so now it's not even about me. Meaning, would you do what you do if the outcome wasn't attached to what you were doing? That's why I don't even get caught up with people that do things for money. I'm not impressed with how much money you make. You know the true level of wealth? You know the true measure of wealth? Is if they took all your money, what would you be worth then? I'm gonna say it again so you can catch it. This to everybody that's chasing that greenback, everybody that wants that dollar. If you got it, and they stripped you of it all, what would you still be worth? And if you don't have the things that the process creates, you won't keep it anyway. You see, my mother had me when she was 15 years old, right? Over on the east side of Atlanta, we came up in this neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood, drug dealer on every corner, gang members in the neighborhood, two bedroom home, 14 people, used to sleep on the floor. Got the opportunity to sleep in the bed one time out of the week. There were six of us in the bed, three at the foot, three at the head. And I came up with this dream pretty quick. I said, man, I want to go to the NFL because I had eight uncles in that house, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison. My uncle just got sentenced to 40, years in prison a couple of weeks ago. He just got done doing eight years in prison, got out for two years. The two years he was out, got locked up five more times. Cops ran in our house on the regular. And so pretty quick, I said, man, I want to go to the NFL. And so I went to my big cousin tomorrow one night. I said, man, listen, I want to go to the NFL. And so we got to work for this thing. So the thing we're going to do every night, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action. Every night, we're going to race light pole to light pole with no shoes. So every night, we would get out in the street, race light pole to light pole. One night, a coach came down the street. He signed me and my cousins up for organized sports, right? First time being in organized sports. We get in organized sports. The thing was, after practice, everybody would leave to go home. And I always had to sit on the bench and wait on my mother because she worked at Wendy's. And so when my mother would show up in the park, it would be about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. And so I'm sitting there, and when my mother would pull up, she drove an old Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up in the park 10.30 at night. I would jump off the bench. I would sprint over to my mother. I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I have to do some extra drills. I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired. And every night, my mother would sit back in that car, and those car lights would hit that field. And here you had a seven-year-old kid doing back pedaling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. But just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes. And so it made me dig a little bit deeper. It made me push myself a little bit further. It made me work a little bit harder. It created a certain level of sweat equity in what I was doing. It created a certain level of pride in what I was doing. You know why people quit? People don't have pride in what they do. You know why people stop? They're selfish, and it's just about them. But when you have a bigger purpose to why you're doing what you're doing and you want to honor the sacrifices that others have made for you, it's nothing for you to keep going when you hear adversity. And I'll never forget, one night I came off the field and I went over to my mother. I said, can you please introduce me to my father? I need to meet him. It's a certain dialogue that I need to have with him that I can't have sleeping on the floor with my cousins with roaches and rats. I need to talk to my father. Guy's name is not on my birth certificate. I need to talk to him. Can you set that up? She set it up. First encounter with the guy, shook his hand. I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, hey, little man, I heard you could play ball. I said, I heard you can too, but here's what I need you to do for me. I said, I don't need any money. I don't need any clothes. The only thing I need you to do for me is pick me up every Friday night, work me out every Saturday morning. You could take me back home after that. Can you do that? He said, yeah, I got you. First Saturday morning, he woke me up at 4.30 in the morning. He said, little man, we're running two miles to this fire station, running two miles back home. I said, cool, let's do it. Every other Saturday morning after that, wake up 4.30, run two miles there, two miles back. 
One Saturday, I said, man, I'm going to beat him out. I beat him out to the line. I'm standing there. My father came dragging out of the house. He was walking really slow. And so my father came out, and he walked right by me. And I looked up, and he walked right by me, and he looked up at me, and he said, son. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. And in my mind, I'm thinking, it's, it's not another person out here. What is he talking about? It's 4.30. It's dark. He kept walking. He looked up again. He said, son. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. Yes, sir. But in my mind at this point, I'm saying, man, he's trying to talk his way out of this thing. So the third time he said, son, I stepped back. I said, listen, pops, no disrespect. You have a job. I get it. You may be tired. I said, so you can go back in the house, you can go to sleep. There's no hard feelings, but you can't stop me from running to this fire station. I'm running whether you go or not. And he said, son, the thing I'm trying to get you to understand is this, ain't Son, there is another person inside of you, son. The thing I'm trying to get you to understand is this, ain't No matter how hard you work, there is somebody inside of you that works even harder. He said, son, no matter how dedicated you are, there is somebody inside of you that's more dedicated. Son, no matter how committed you are, there is somebody inside of you that's more committed. But the thing I want you to understand, there will come a point in time where you will hit a piece of adversity that's a lot tougher than you, son. And every day you get up, you will have to have a greater purpose for why you do what you do. And to get up and keep going and executing whatever you do, son. That is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's a lot bigger than running to the fire station. I'm trying to get you to push yourself to a point that you have never been to before. Because when you get to that point, you're going to propel to another dimension of your life, not another level, another dimension of your life. And immediately I got it. And it had nothing to do with me. Immediately I got it because I saw on down the line of what it could produce in my life. Immediately I got it. It wasn't because I wanted to be fast. I got what the product could produce. I got what getting up at 430 in the morning could produce in me and my family's life. And so I went to Crim High School, one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia. Dropout rate higher than the graduation rate. People didn't go to college. I went to Crim. My first day, I walked through the doors. A metal detective cop said, what's your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go D1. He said, no, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. He said, no, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. After my freshman year, my mother and father both came to me and they said, Inky, we're transferring you from this place. You got a scholarship at Tucker High School. They said, all you have to do is come and play your next three years. They guarantee you a scholarship to Georgia. I said, please, leave me at one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia. They said, son, you have a scholarship. All you have to do is go and play your next three years. You will be the first one in our family to go to college. I said, please, leave me at Quim High School. I can get a scholarship from this place. Son, nobody goes to college from there. Please, let me stay here. I can make it from this place. They transferred me anyway. First football game, tore the ligaments in my ankle out for the season, ended up in a wheelchair. Went back to my parents. Will you please transfer me back to one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia? My pastor said, Inky, you really want to go there? He said, son, it's embarrassing. You go back there and you play against an opposing team. You all don't even have water bottles. You drink out of the opposing team's water hose. You want to go back there? He said, son, if I were to go to everybody in your family right now and ask them for $50 or $100, nobody could give it to me. And you really want to go back there? You have a guaranteed scholarship and you're begging to go back to a place where the dropout rate is higher than the graduation rate? Why do you want to go back there? I said, please transfer me back there. I need to go back there. They transferred me back, first football game my junior year, break my collarbone, out for the season. And so the summer heading into my senior year, now everybody is looking at me like, you dumb. You went back to that place, you had a guaranteed scholarship. And you got hurt years back to back, and now no college scouts are coming to see you. And so the summer going into my senior year, we got blessed with a new coach. He came to me, I was done with football. He said, man, please come and work out for me. Just do one workout for me. I said, okay, coach, I'll come out, I'll work out. I ran a 40-yard dash, I did some cone drills. He came up to me after the workout. He said, son, what college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, no, you're not hearing me, son. What college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, after the first couple of games, we'll put together a tape and we'll see what happens. After the first two games, I had nine touchdowns. It was all she wrote from there. But after that season, there was still two problems. 
I wasn't qualified to get into college and I hadn't passed my Georgia high school graduation test. And so now scouts would come in and they would say, man, you're cute, you're fast, you're quick, you're tough, you can play football, but son, we're not talking about college, we're talking about you graduating high school. And I'm the type of person, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I might not know at that moment how I'm going to get it done, but if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'll find a way to get it done. I have that much faith in what I'm doing, I have that much faith in what I do, that I'll get it done. And every college scout would say, no, Inc., it doesn't work that way, we can't offer you a scholarship. I said, please offer me a scholarship. And I'll never forget the day the University of Tennessee came in and a coach took a chance on me. And he sat down with me and he said, son, I want to offer you a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. It was so crazy. I responded and I told him, I'm coming. And he laughed. He said, son, I don't even think you understand how the whole process works. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I said, you're talking to a kid that comes from a two-bedroom home, 14 people. You're talking to a kid that every morning when I caught the bus, I would race to be the first one at the bus stop, and I would be standing there shaking my book bag and my jackets out to make sure there were no roaches and rats. So when I tell you I am coming, I am coming. You don't even have to waste the university's money. I don't have to see the campus. I don't have to see the city. You offer me a scholarship, I'm coming. He said, yeah, Inc., but I still want you to take an official visit. I agreed. I went up on a Friday night. I'll never forget, they took me to Calhoun's on the river. It's a restaurant in Knoxville, Tennessee. We come out, we got a host, right? And so the job of a host is supposed to show you a great time on campus, take you to parties, make you fall in love with the place. And so I come out with my host and he said, Inc., there's a sorority party, there's a barbecue, and there's a basketball game. Which one would you like to go to? I said, man, if you don't mind, can you take me to my hotel? He said, what? He said, man, I don't know if you've ever been to a college sorority party. He said, well, boy, they get pretty real. I said, man, can you take me to my hotel? We pull up to the hotel, I'm getting out of the car. He said, wait, are you sick? I said, no, I'm not sick. You see, what my host didn't understand, that night at the Marriott, that was my first time standing in the bed by myself. I think I cared about a sorority party. I think I cared about a barbecue or a basketball game. I went up in that room, I called my boys back in Kirkwood. I said, man, y'all ain't gonna believe this. I said, man, y'all boys gotta go to college. They said, Inc., we might consider. I said, get your own king size bed. But the next day when I saw that coach, I thanked him, and I still do this until this day when I see him. I said, thank you, not only for changing my life, but changing a whole generation's life that you don't even know you touch. The same bike trail, I used to walk home with my wife on a bike trail. Me and my wife been at it ever since we were in the fifth grade. I used to walk home on a bike trail with my wife. The same bike trail that me and my wife used to walk home on, and this is Kirkwood today, not Kirkwood back when we grew up. The same bike trail we used to walk home on, a kid came home from the army one day, he got on that same bike trail with his wife. They're walking down the bike trail, a 14-year-old walks up to him, a 20-year-old walks up to him. The 20-year-old looked at the 14-year-old and said, shoot him. 14-year-old put a gun to her head, blew his brains out for no apparent reason. So this was the environment that I was talking about. And so when I got back to Kirkwood, I went to everybody that told me I wouldn't make it. I went to that cop in that lunchroom and I said, I told you, you had the wrong guy. So now everybody's response was, Inc., why did you fight so hard to come back to Quim High School? You had a guaranteed scholarship across town at one of the top programs. Why did you fight to come back with a dropout rate was higher than the graduation rate, son? Why did you fight to come back to this place? And I said, you guys are missing the boat. I had a chance to ride an airplane once when I was in high school. It was to an all-star football game. And I'll never forget, I went in the bathroom on that airplane, and as I was washing my hands, I was going to leave, and there was a sign on the wall, and that sign said, as common courtesy to the person that's coming behind you, can you wipe the sink out and leave it better than you found it? Well, as common courtesy to the generation that was coming to Krim High School behind me, I was about to leave that place better than I found it. And the thing that people didn't understand, the reason I had that decision and choice to make, it wasn't about Inky Johnson. Every night I slept on that floor with those roaches and rats, I had three little cousins that slept on that same floor as me. And you know what happened? When I went to college, you know what all three of them, I was the first one in my family to go to college. You know what all three of my little cousins did? Man, I don't have to sell dope. I don't have to join a gang. I don't have to end up in prison. I don't have to end up dead. All three of them got up off the same floor, went to college and graduated, and now they serve in the Army. That is why I went back to Krim High School. Had nothing to do with me. 
If every decision and choice you make is just about you, at a certain point you're going to hit something that's a lot tougher than you and it's going to make you quit because you don't have a driving force for why you do what you do. But when I got up to the University of Tennessee, it was simple. It was simple for me to give everything I had. And they wrote an article about me, the first article that ever got written about me. It said, Mr. No Star has made it to the University of Tennessee. Basically saying, Mr. Nobody has made it to the University of Tennessee. How did this guy get here? I was 135 pounds soaking wet. Coming from Krim High School, a place where the dropout rate is higher than the graduation rate. Coming from a place where people didn't go to college. And I'll never forget the cats were reading the article and they were laughing and they gave it to me. They said, Ink, have you seen this? I said, no, nah, I ain't seen it. Let me, let me see it. And I held it up in front of him. I said, Mr. Nostar, the kid that came from Krim High School. Mr. Nostar, the kid that was born to his mother at 15. Mr. Nostar, the kid that came from that two bedroom, 14 people. Mr. Nostar, the kid that slept on the floor. Mr. Nostar, the kid that missed meals and never made one excuse. And I took it and I folded it up and I put it in my back pocket. My freshman year, I played special teams. My sophomore season, I broke the star lineup, had a really strong sophomore season. The summer heading into my junior year, I still remember the day where I was sitting in our film room and I was watching film on the California Bears. My defensive backs coach, Larry Slade, came in the room. He said, Inky, I got some good news for you. I dropped the click. I said, what is it? He said, man, you're a projected top 30 draft pick, son. He said, all you have to do is play the next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I went out of the room, I called my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. I said, after this season, there will be no more struggle. I said, we would never miss another meal. I said, we would never experience another Christmas where we have to stand on the side of the curb and just be grateful. And I hung it up. First football game, I went out, played great, got an interception, shut Cal down. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, got late in the game, fourth quarter, Guy dropped back, he threw the ball to a receiver coming down my sideline. Me and the guy, we went head on. Soon as I hit the guy, I felt as if every breath of my body left. Body went completely limp, fell to the ground, I blacked out. Never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, I'll never forget, my teammates ran over, they said, Ain't get up, let's go. I said, I can't. I said, I can't move. They said, what do you mean you can't move? You're our lockdown corner, man, we need you, let's go. I said, I know, man, but this time I can't move. The shock stayed in my body, and I'll never forget as I was lying there, I flipped my head to the left, and the doctors and the trainers were running onto the field, and I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God, I said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. I flipped my head back over to the left, they were bringing the spine board out. They put me up on the spine board, I said, God, they have to do that, right? I said, that's precautionary measure. Doctor was rolling me off the field. We get to midfield. I said, Doc, can you lift my right arm up? Because I couldn't feel it. That stuck me with all type of needles. Inky, can you feel this? I couldn't feel a thing. He said, sure, Inky. And he lifted my right arm up, and I raised my left, and I pumped it to the supporters. I don't like using the word fans. I think it's an arrogant term. Who might have called a person a fan? They pay to see you play their supporters. I said, Doc, you can let my arm down. And as he was letting my arm down, I'll never forget. I looked in his eyes. I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll be back. Never thinking that would be the last football game that I would ever play in my life. They rolled me to the ambulance. My father was waiting there. He was, had this look of concern on his face. I said, Pops, I got him, right? He said, yeah, son, but I think you got, I think you got the worst part of this one, eh? They got me over to the hospital. They took me back. They ran CAT scans. They brought me back into my room. And all in a 15-second time frame, I'll never forget I was lying in my bed, and I flipped my head back, and I caught eyes with my father. And he went to take a step in, and he looked at me, and he said, no, I can't do it walked out. My mother, she came in, she happy go lucky, she smiling, she kissed me on my head, she said a prayer in my ear, she said, Ink, everything is gonna be okay. And she walked out, and as soon as she stepped outside of the room, the doctor came running in from the opposite side. He said, hey, get in there, we gotta rush this guy back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. I said, what? He said, son, you have busted up the clavian artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally, we have to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. When I opened my eyes from recovery, the same doctor was over me. He said, son, has some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I said, tell him I was about to die. I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is, Ink, you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, okay, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I said, okay, cool. 
He said, but son, it's a strong possibility that you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. I said, no disrespect to you, doc, but I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. I said, no disrespect to you, doc, but you wasn't in the park with me and my mother when I was seven years old and she was sitting in that Buick Regal she got done working at Wendy's. No disrespect to you, doc, but you didn't come up in that two-bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor. No disrespect to you, doc, but you didn't miss those meals and stay focused and never made an excuse. I never cheated. I never cheated. Like, my conscience, still until this day, won't let me cheat. Like, I can't cheat. I can't look myself in the mirror and say, Ink, you did a good job knowing that I cheated. I can't cheat. My conscience won't let me cheat. And I'll never forget, I said, man, no way my career could be over. I worked too hard, for I respected the game. I gave it everything that I had. There's no way that my career can be over. I said, send me up to the Mayo Clinic. Surely they'll tell me I can play again. They sent me up to the Mayo Clinic. The final meeting happened. It was me, my mother, and my father in the room, and I'll never forget it. An interview prior to that meeting, a reporter came out and he said, Inky Johnson is going about this situation as if he knows something that everybody else doesn't. And we walked into this meeting and the doctors came in. They said, Ink, here's the deal. Let's get right down to it. They said, son, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. They said, your brachial plexus are the nerve roots that go from your spine that controls your arm and your hand. You have torn them at all levels. They cannot be replugged. It says, son, we hate to tell you, but your arm, it will never be the same again. Your hand, it will never be the same again. Your shoulder, it will never be the same again. Son, we hate to tell you, but you can never play the game of football again. As a matter of fact, we understand prior to college, you averaged 30 points per game as a point guard. Son, you can never play the game of basketball again. As a matter of fact, we understand prior to college, you played travel league baseball your whole life, played center field and batted cleanup. Son, you can never play the game of baseball again. As a matter of fact, prior to college, son, we understood you ran track. You ran the 100, the 200, the 4 by one and the 400. Your arm would never be in a condition for you to run track again. What do you do when all your options get taken away in an instant? And then they proceeded to say, here are your surgery options, Inc. We can take a muscle out of the back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with a weak left leg and a weak right arm the rest of your life. Or we can take a nerve out of your left arm, reroute it up through your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with two weak arms the rest of your life. Or we can take a nerve out of your left rib, reroute it up through your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with a breathing problem and a weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do in the morning. I was 20 years old. And the next morning I walked into the doctor's office. They said, son, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you, doc. Cut me where you got to cut me. I know I'll come out of this situation okay. They said, cut with the cute talk. We're some of the best doctors in the world, Inc. We're the reason that you came up here. And so you have to choose an option. So tell us what option are you choosing and where do you want us to cut you? I said, no disrespect to you, doc. Cut me where you got to cut me. I know I will come out of this situation okay. And they proceeded to cut me six times down my left thigh. They cut me one time across my left shoulder, one time across my right shoulder. They cut me in my right pec, in my right rib. They cut me from the bottom of my armpit all the way down to the bottom of my hand. They put over 350 staples in my body. They bandaged me from my neck down to my knees. And I still was in class that next week. When they gave me an opportunity to go home, and you know why I went to class? You know why I was able to go in that doctor's office and say, cut me where you gotta cut me. I know it will come out of this situation, okay? Because I made up in my mind before I even stepped into the doctor's office that no matter what the outcome was, I wasn't quitting, I wasn't giving up, I wasn't stopping. That's not my pedigree, that's not who I am, and so I'm not even gonna entertain it. And I think the quicker you eliminate something, the quicker that you make up in your mind you're gonna get to the outcome. It's just like the Navy sales. It's just like the SEALs, that's why the SEALs are so bad. They make up in their mind before the mission that they're going to complete the mission. They make up in their mind before they set out on the mission, we are going to complete the mission, meaning if it does not kill me, if I get an arm injury along the way, a leg injury along the way, a feet injury along the way, if you do not kill me, you will not stop my drive. No petty adversity will not stop me. I have to complete every mission that I set out on. One of the greatest pieces of advice that my mother gave me was this, son, whenever you start, you make sure you finish. And the problem with the world today, people get involved with things and if they don't like a certain person, if they don't like the process, if it's not what they thought it was, they quit. And what they don't understand about quitting, quitting become, becomes a habit that doesn't just affect you. Later on in life when you get a wife and you get some kids or you get a family, it's going to come back to hunt you and it will one day affect them. 
That is why I tell you the process is more important than the product. It's not even about the outcome for me. It's about can you take pride in what you do as an individual and every night when you look in the mirror knowing that you gave everything you had to it. And no money doesn't have to be attached to it. It's about learning to work from the inside out in life and not from the outside in. When you work from the inside out in life, you understand your why, you understand your how, and you understand your what. When you work from the outside in, you understand your what, you understand your how, and you understand your why. People that work from the inside out, Martin Luther King. Why I'm going to do this. How I'm going to do this. What I'm going to do. People that work from the inside out, Apple. Change the world. People that work from the inside out, Zuckerberg. People that work from the inside out, MJ. People that work from the outside in, worrying about the outcome first, never make it because they get to a certain point and life is going to test that will. Every time. Life is going to see how bad you want what you say you want. And so if it's never a level of commitment to it, and what commitment is, commitment, people think commitment is just saying, yes, I'll do it. Because the environment is right and it's cute. People get in certain environments, man, are you going to do it? Do you feel like doing it? Do you think it's right? Yeah, man, let's do it. It's cool. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. But what commitment is, commitment is staying true to what you said you were going to do long after the mood that you have set it in has left. Meaning when you don't feel like getting up in the morning, you get your butt up in the morning, you do what you said you were going to do anyway. Meaning when you don't feel like sacrificing, you get your butt up and you sacrifice anyway. Meaning when you don't feel like being dedicated to it, you stay your butt dedicated anyway because you understand what the process will go on to produce later on in your life. It's not about the outcome. Eliminate the outcome. And we have to get to the point where we're willing to impose our will on certain things. Impose your will on it. It's just as if you were facing an opponent. Impose your will on it. Life will give in to you if, it's no, if it knows you're serious about whatever it is that you're trying to do. Life will give in to you. When I went back to school, I had to learn how to write all over again with my left hand. I've been right hand dominant my whole life. You think the teacher came up to me and said, Ink, I know you got a paralyzed right arm and you don't know how to write again. We're going to give you a little leverage. We're going to let you take your time on these 30-page papers. No. Inky, here's your 30-page paper. I need it by tomorrow. And I had some great friends, but I didn't have one friend that was about to knock out a 30-page paper for me. I had to sit my butt in disability services and write that paper by myself. I had to learn how to tie my shoe all over again. I had to go up to people and say, man, can you help my roommates? Can you help bathe me, man? My life totally changed. And they gave me an opportunity to stop. And most people, when you give them an opportunity to stop while they're chasing something, they take advantage of it because they feel as if, man, why did this have to happen to me? I felt as if, why not me? This is the perfect opportunity to use this to be a blessing to somebody else. And you know what? It's not even about me to be truthful. It's not even about me. Now it's about repaying the people that invested in me and saw something in me when I couldn't see it in myself. Now this is the perfect time to give them a return on their investment. That's why I went on to get my master's degree. At a certain point in life, it can't just be about you. When, when do we get to the point where we start honoring the sacrifices that others have made for us? When do we get to the point where we say, Mom, I really appreciate those sacrifices you made for me, so I'm not quitting as a result of it. I guarantee you I'm coming out of Michigan State with a degree. I guarantee it. And it doesn't matter the outcome. It doesn't matter what I go through. I guarantee you. I went to my mother and I told her, I will never embarrass you. I will never quit because you sat in the park with me when I was seven years old. So it's not even about me having a paralyzed right arm. It's not even that deep. The reason I wake up and live my life the way that I do, because I understand somebody is looking to me for my passion, somebody is looking to me for my zeal, somebody is looking to me for my energy, and somebody is looking to me every day to keep going, just like somebody is dependent on each of you. It's not about you, man. Blessings don't come to you, blessings flow through you. And the moment that you understand that, you will realize your existence is not just about you. It's a lot of people that paved the way for you to be in a position that you're in. Honor that. Have a certain level of pride in what you do. Take pride in what you do. If your last name is on something, you should operate a certain way. You shouldn't just do it just to do it. I don't understand how people do that. How can people get up and just go through the flow in life? How do people do that? Like, I can't do that. When I look at my son, I can't say, son, I just got up and I flowed through life today. 
And he looked back at me like, Dad, you just flowed. No, I can't do that. I can't tell my wife, baby, I just flowed through life today. When I look at my wife, I tell her, no matter what happens in our life, no matter what we go through, you're going to be straight. You're going to be straight. You're going to be straight. You'll never have to worry about a thing. My kids will never see the life that I saw when I was a kid. I'm promising that. They, they're not seeing it right now. They will never see it because of who I am. And I understand who I am. And I know I'm a go-getter. When it boils down to it, I'm a go-getter. And I'm a flat-out go and get it. And nothing will not stop me from getting it. A lot of people, they have to be chasing something or has to be a reward attached to it or they seek some type of validation or they need some type of encouragement, a pat on the back to say, man, you're doing a good job. What do you tell me I'm doing a good job or not? I'm going to give everything I got to everything I'm involved in because that's just the way I'm cut. I'm going to give everything I got to everything I'm involved in because that's the way I'm cut. You don't have to give me a reward for it. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's how I'm supposed to rock and that's how I'm supposed to live my life. I don't need no reward. I don't need no cookie. Like I'm checking in the Hampton and you giving me a cookie because I'm checking in. No, I'm gonna live my life a certain type of way because this is the standard of excellence that I should possess. Standard of excellence in everything that I do. It's not about the outcome, it's not about the circumstance, it's not about the situation, it's not about people. It's about me taking pride in what I do and having a certain standard of excellence. I could have worked at McDonald's. I guarantee you, I would have been the best worker at McDonald's there was. I could have washed cars. I guarantee you, I would have been the best car washer that was. They had nothing to do with the outcome. That's just how I'm cut. I'm going to go get it because I'm built for it. Stop needing a reward for what you do. Stop seeking validation for what you do. If you set out and you say you're going to do something, do yourself a favor and don't lie to yourself. Because that is the worst thing that an individual can ever do. You think you're lying to your peers, right? You think you lying to your mother. You think you lying to your teacher. You think you lying to your coach. At the end of the day, when you look in the mirror, you lying to you. Because that's your life. In 10 years from now, nobody can do anything for you. That's going to be the life that you created, not anybody else. The life that you created, you make your bed, you got to lay in it. And the moment that we understand that and every day we wake up, we understand that life is a blessing and life is a gift. And if you were to check out today, how would you want to be remembered? It's bigger than you. We have to elevate to that point where we keep that standard, we keep that expectation in everything that we do and understand that it's a lot bigger than us. Us doing everything that we do is a lot bigger than us and we want to leave a legacy in everything that we do. People just want to be good. People just want to look cute doing things. I don't want to look cute. I don't care about being cool. Think I care about being cool? Man, there's people dying out here. There's young black males getting their life taken. It's people depending on us out here in the world. They got care about being cool. I would rather somebody look at me and say, man, that cat came from the hood in Atlanta. His mother had him at 15. He came from a two bedroom home, 14 people. He slept on the floor with roaches and rats. He missed meals at night. His arm got paralyzed while he was in college chasing a dream. He was eight games away from the NFL. He almost lost his life. He was back in class the next week. He went on to get this bachelor's degree. He went on to get his master's degree. That's cool. That's who I want to be like. Because he never gave up. And I don't plan on giving up anytime soon. As a matter of fact, I'll go on record right now on tape to tell you I'll never give up. Regardless of what may happen. Because I'm chasing something different. And it's not about the product, it's about the process. It's about me understanding, me going at things a certain type of way, what it's going to build and instill within me that's going to sustain me for the rest of my life.